The following message is from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. We pray that you'll be encouraged and challenged by the Word of God so that you trust fully in Jesus Christ. More information is available at our website, www.gracepointtucson.org. All right, if you guys can make your way inside, we will, we will begin this morning. All right, good to see so many of you guys here, so many new faces, I can see visitors. Welcome to Grace Point, and uh, I just want <clears throat> to take the opportunity. Today is a day where a lot of churches, and we're recognizing those who have served as a law enforcement or any kind of in any kind of such capacity if that is you are you able to stand up so we can uh, say hello to you i know viz is around here there he is he's in the back anyone else all right yeah thank you for your service uh the word of god is a uh, is a is a is a book full of laws and we like law keeping and we like safety so thank you guys so much for your service also this week is Sports camp, yes. Marie remembers. Marie, and Marie's going to come forward and uh, share an announcement about this for us. Good morning, everyone. I'm ready, and I hope you are too, but I have two things. I got messages yesterday from two people. Uh, Gail Moran had planned to be one of my uh, blue team team leaders working with Robin Smith, and she cannot do that. Her father is in the hospital, and she's working all day and then trying to visit him in the evening, and so she cannot do that. So I need someone to step up and take her place because we need two adults with each one of our groups. It's just a, a position where you'll hang out with the kids all night long. You'll just follow them around to different areas and be their support system and be in love on them. So if you're willing to step up to that position, I'd love to talk to you after church. Also, if you did not... If you are working in sports camp and did not get an email from me this week, please stop by the table and pick one up because I have one for you. It tells you what time to be there and what we're going to be doing. Also, if you're helping for the first time and you need a purple shirt, I have purple shirts at the table, so stop by and pick that up tonight because we're all going to be identified in purple shirts. And I'm ready for sports camp. I've got a pedicure this week, and I've got a purple, red, green, blue, and yellow toe. So I'm all ready for sports camp. All right. And I was unable to keep my uh, appointment for a manicure, but I will be there as well. So sports camp. Also, uh, Marie was mentioning, be, make sure you guys are there at 4.30 because we're going to talk uh, logistics and what that looks like and getting ready. And so we need any help. If you're bored and you don't have any plans, then come show up and you can help uh, love on the kids for sure. So that's coming up. Excited about that. We are getting ready. Also, the uh, Gonzalez's were lovely, and they made us some bumper stickers for Grace Point. Maybe you guys got handed one of these. So <clears throat> please put them on your car if you're a Christ-like driver, okay? If, if, <laughs> if you're running people off the road, honking your horn, you know, th then go ahead and just leave that on your seat for someone else. But if not, go ahead and put that on your vehicle and, uh, and let people know that we're here. So... Today, for our call to worship, I wanted to read a few verses from Psalm 16. <clears throat> so I want to read this. This is from Psalm 16. I'll start in verse 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Is that your Lord this morning? I feel secure in the Lord. Today, we have the privilege of the youth band is going to lead us in worship. So if you guys want to come forward, and I'll pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you, Lord, today that we could be in your house with your people and worship. We just want to give you all of our praise. We want to lay our hearts down, God, and be ministered to you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Hi. 
And just as Gabe said on this glorious day, the youth is worshiping, so can you please stand? Was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn to honor you. I was breathing, but not. My failures I try to hide. It was my to to amend you. Coming on the clouds, kings and kings. 
chains Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Who can stop the So uh, I got to play as part of the youth band today. That was fun. Um, so let's look at the our prayer list this week. Just want I don't know if you guys had all heard, but Randy and Wanda got COVID. Uh, I think they had had it once before, so I think they're seasoned veterans, but they are recovering in the process. Uh, Randy's starting to feel a little better. I hear he's talking about going golfing again soon. 
Uh, Wanda is, it's, it's stirring up a little bit of her, her complications for before. But uh, so let's be in prayer for Randy and Wanda for sure. Also, as we mentioned, Sheila has progressed to um, cancer and pancreatic cancer, and so she just has a lot of things that we need to be praying for her. And I want to just thank, uh, thank God for our law enforcement as well, and I just want to lift up sports camp. Uh, we have this awesome opportunity to minister to our kids, to love on the community, and I hope that many of you guys will show up and join us. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you, Lord, and uh, we just want to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, God, who are suffering, who are recovering, God, who are moving on to next steps in, in chemo and cancer. God, we just ask you, Lord, to move on behalf of these, of these brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we know that you, uh, that you love and that you hear, hear us and that you heal us, God. And so we just want to come to you, O great physician, Lord, and petition for our friends, and for all of these challenges that are out in the world, Lord, I thank you for our law enforcement, God, who still are allowed to enforce laws. God, we pray that more governors would allow their police officers to enforce the law, God. We pray that this would be a land of order and not of chaos. And we thank you, Lord, that that is modeled in your word, and that's by your design. So we thank you for those faithful who serve you, God, and for everyone around the uh, country who serves as well. And God, I just want to lift up our sports camp this week. God, I pray that kids would know come to know you. That, uh, that hearts would be challenged and encouraged, God, that we would be able to pour into, the, into this community, Lord, and hopefully let other people know that we're here and that we want to love on them and share the gospel of Christ. And so, God, we thank you for all of these opportunities. We thank you for the weight of ministry. And help us, Lord, to do everything for your glory and for your honor. And so in your name we pray. Amen. At this time, the kiddos are released to their classrooms. And uh, so... You guys can go find your classrooms and your teachers. And I believe Nancy Kunse, where is she? There she is. She's going to read the scriptures for us this morning. So if you guys could stand to your feet in honor of God's word. Acts 13, 1 through 12. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And the youth have one more song for us. Yeah, please don't sit. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, there we go. So 
Good morning, everyone. So we get to uh, see, I'm actually really excited because finally the text is going to admit that Saul is Paul. And uh, so I don't have to keep checking myself wanting to say Paul when the text has not told us that is his name yet. But today we're going to get to see the Apostle Saul going full, full on Apostle Paul this morning uh, to, re- to the relief of the pastor. And... Uh, so I need, I, I need I, I, it's been a struggle. It's not Paul, it's not Paul, it's Saul. But uh, today we're going to get to look at him lay down the hammer of rebuke, okay, on, a, on, a, on a, another magician. We've encountered a magician before, and uh, that guy repented and came to know Christ. This man, however, is standing opposed to Paul and the message of the gospel. And so we're going to look at that this morning. So I'm going to pick up the first three verses. Now there were those... Uh, in the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius the Serene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And see, this is the commission of, the, of Paul's first missionary journey. And it's actually important for us to notice in, in the Word of God, when it, and it names titles and specific uh, names of men, what this is saying is to those this, this was originally written to, these people were still around and someone that you could probably check these facts with. So you could have gone back and asked Lucius and asked si- uh, Simeon and asked Menea, did, call, did, did the Lord really call Paul? Did this really happen? And so, so we need to understand, this is one of the things that Luke is doing when he's writing this. He's dropping these, these hints in the text so that we can know and that, and that they could know at the time that they could check that these things were true. And so there's this group of men. Remember, they've gathered together because ministry has been happening. The word has gone forth. 
to the Gentiles. And so there's been leaders that have gathered together now and have been handling this work. And they were sort of having a, uh, a leadership meeting here, fasting and praying, and the Lord speaks to them. And this, notice the idea of calling here. This is what ordination is about. Is about all the, all the, by the way, to be a leader in the church is not to notice a particular man's talent or to even to notice someone's desire to be up front. But it's to affirm the calling of God, that, they are, that God has prepared them for service. And so the Lord speaks into the assembly of these men and to men that were known in this community, and the Lord designates some of them to go. They're seeking the Lord, and the Lord speaks. And notice, we've already seen Saul and Barnabas been acting what? Faithful. Barnabas has been the faithful encourager. He's got out and he's sought Paul, they've, gone, they've already done fundraising together while going around the country. And Paul has been faithful, so faithful that he kept putting his life on the line and the church had to send him away, right? And so they've been faithfully ministering and now God is saying, I'm going to use these two. So I want to talk about just commissioning and the call of God just for a moment here. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says this, Instead, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, not in order to please men, but God, who examines our hearts. See, there needs to be a calling here because ministry is difficult. Sometimes in ministry, you have to say difficult things. That makes people in the audience squirm a little bit. As we're going to see, Paul does that this morning. Because there are things that are upsetting in the Word of God. It's upsetting to find out that you're totally estranged from God. And on your way, leading to judgment if you don't repent and believe. It's also sometimes shocking to, for Christians to understand that, yeah, the way that we live our life and conduct our life matters. Are we living a life that's honoring to Christ? Or are we using the excuse of, well, I've been forgiven to continue to live like the world? See, being in ministry is recognizing that the Word of God is often stepping on our toes. Well, it is encouraging us and drawing us forward in our walk. And so the leaders have to be willing to do that. It's not that someone's just interested, they want to be a substitute to fill in, and they have some sort of passing interest, or someone who desires to be in the limelight. No, it's a calling because it is difficult. Could we have the sanctuary lights brought up? It's kind of like, uh, I feel like I'm speaking into a cave here a little bit. Uh, they'll, they'll get it. So the idea is, right, the pastor and the missionary needs to remember that his heart is examined by God and his teaching is scrutinized, there it is, by God and by the Holy Spirit. And the man speaking is going to give an account. Like, do you know how many times I've said this, that I'm going to stand before God and God's going to say, you said this from the pulpit. And I'm going to have to sit there and he's going to, you got this wrong. You did this right. Hopefully, there's, there'll be some in there that I did right, you know. But we have to stand and give an account, and that's why there needs to be a calling. There needs to be a calling, not simply a desire. I, I always think of Ezekiel 3 when I think of this idea of calling. Read the first three chapters in Ezekiel and find out how difficult his task was. But when you're, when you're thinking about someone calling, being called to ministry, I want to just read a couple verses here. This is the Lord speaking to him. He says, if I say... if If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. He's still going to die. But his blood I will acquire at your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall surely die for his iniquity. But you will have delivered your soul. Even if they don't respond, you still have to speak. You still have to speak what might be hard. What, might, what other people may not want to hear. And that's what I care about. See, so often we think, well, it depends on how they respond. That'll know if I was doing a good job. No. Did you open your mouth? See, so many people should say, well, well I don't want to be known. We shouldn't be known for what we, we should be known for what we're for, not what we're against. Okay, well, the Bible doesn't say that. See, there's a burden for leadership where we need to speak into the culture, into our world, into our friends, into their lives, and remind them this. God is against this. 
This breaks God's heart. This brings God's judgment. This is why the Lord went to the cross. And as followers of Christ, we should have nothing to do with that. And the culture needs to hear this message. Repent and believe. See, there's a burden to leadership, and it's very difficult. And especially so when you have a church that doesn't support that idea. We just want to hear nice things. That James 1, James 3 writes this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that, you, that we who teach will be judged with this greater, greater strictness. This warning is about what we say, and we need to know that what we say comes from the abundance, and we know that the, what we say comes from the abundance of our hearts. Amen? But if we are people pleasers, if we're men fearers, we will compromise the truth, or we'll skip over sections that are hard in the Word of God. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit to call men to ministry. When people seek ministry, this is what ordination is all about. It's to confirm the call. It's the same thing that happens at your jobs, right? You work hard, you distinguish yourself, you do a good job, and that tends to be when the promotion comes. The do a good job part, right, is really important because you can distinguish yourself in a different way at work, can't you? You can distinguish yourself as a fool, and then wonder why you never get recognized or why you always get the terrible shift or why they don't trust you very well at work. Okay? And it's the same thing in ministry. God uses proven men and women and calls them. And we need to understand that this is, this is the case. So my, my first point for us this morning is God is the one who calls those into leadership. God calls His own into leadership because there's a weight there. And sometimes, sometimes... A leader has to be reminded with only his calling because the ministry is so hard. It's so dark. People are so against the message that he just has to go back to the fact that, well, I was called. I don't get a weasel my way out. And so the Lord calls here Paul and Barnabas. You know, when I was young, I used to work for Alpha Graphics. I've told some of you guys this before. I was driving around Park Place. Before it was Place, it was still a mall. I was driving over there making some delivery, and I was driving, and I remember the Lord spoke to me very vividly. It wasn't audibly, but it was just an impression, and it wasn't from inside me. I knew it wasn't me, and it was just kind of like, can I use you for ministry? And I was just overwhelmed, and I had to pull over, and I was like, oh my gosh, I think the Lord just spoke to me, and I need to respond. Yes, Lord, I will pursue you in ministry. Yes, Lord, I will get myself educated. Yes, Lord. And by the way, it shouldn't just be a voice in your head. (laughs) There should be people that come along and confirm and affirm the calling who evaluate you. That's what the ordination process is about. The Lord calls and other people acknowledge. And that's what's happening here to Paul and Barnabas. So verse 4, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So they're going back to the island. When they arrived at Salamis, so this is on the... This is on the far east end of the island. They proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Remember, this is John Mark from the last chapter. It was his house that Peter shows up at the door knocking, and, and they forget to let him in. So the Spirit now, has now is sending them. And Saul is following his pattern. Right? We're going to find a synagogue. We're going to speak to the Jews first. Do you guys know why that is? Because they should have been the easiest people to share the gospel with. They already had the background. They worshiped the right God already. They have the, all of the text that he would be preaching from was their own Old Testament Bible. <clears throat> they were anticipating the Messiah. And so that should have been really easy for him to do, but this is, ends up where he finds the most pushback. And so he goes and he speaks in his familiar format, talking to the Jews. And so we need to understand when he's going into synagogues and he's speaking, this isn't cold calls. He has a foundation already with these people. He should have a shoe in. But as it as happens, he, always, he often finds pushback in, the, in these situations. And so John Mark is assisting the two of them. So Barnab- the calling is on, Paul, is on Paul and Barnabas, but John Mark is kind of there helping out. Maybe he's handing out tracts or something. I don't know. But he's there helping. Verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island of Patmos as far as Paphos, so they've gone from the, the west side all the way to the east side now, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Bar means son of. So this guy had a, had a, had a father named Jesus. 
And don't think that's weird. That Jesus was actually a common name. It's like Yeshua. It would have been Joshua in the Hebrew. So it was a common name. <clears throat> and a lot of times in the scripture, when there's common names, it'll say bar in front of it. So then you'll know the guy we're talking about is the son of this person. So <clears throat> they encounter this guy. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, and who summoned Barnabas and Saul, sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So once again, we see the picture of the forces of enemy here using the agents of Satan to fight against the proclamation of the gospel. We've seen this opposition so far in the Jews and in the religious leaders and even in the government, right? But now we're seeing something else. We're seeing an opposition specifically from the Gentile realm. We saw this before a little bit with Simon the sorcerer, but that was a man honestly caught in the grips of envy, and I think that we can say that he repented. But here's a man who is using his influence to turn the ear of the leader away. Don't let them speak. Don't listen to what they have to say. They're lying. Right? This text tells us that he has the ear of this man. Again, these men are named specifically, and these, these things could be confirmed. So we have this man who's a a son of a Jesus, but he's a false prophet. What's a false prophet? Well, a prophet is someone who gives to men the words of God. We tend to think sometimes of prophecy as, as telling the future, but that was actually more of a rare occurrence in the Old Testament. The primary job that prophets did was to show up and declare, God is coming to town. And you need to repent or he's going to wipe this place out. It was often a oracle of judgment. You guys have gotten off the path. Many times it was to his own children of Israel, right? You guys need to repent or this city is going to come in or this king that you're worried about, this battle that you're worried about, it's going to go really bad for you. But on top of that, there was many other oracles that would speak to other nations as well. God held them accountable as well if they were involved in gross sin. You know, specifically, the reason that uh, the Lord brings the Israelites into the land of Canaan, because they were involved in child sacrifice, okay? Gross acts of violence, and so God judges them. And so that was the primary job of, of prophets. And the primary example we see of false prophets in the Old Testament is when the prophets are standing by while the prophet's speaking, saying, actually, God's not saying that. Actually, God loves you. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. Nah, don't listen to that guy. Do you see what he's wearing? He's probably out in the wilderness, right? We're your faithful prophets. Listen to us. And so they would contradict the word that was warning the people to repent. This is the primary example we see of false prophets. Let me read from Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. <clears throat> if a prophet or a dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Listen to this. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We talked about this before. God will allow a false sign. If you're interested in false signs and you want to chase signs and wonders, God will let you do that. God might even be testing you. About what? Do you care what has been written? Do you care what has been proclaimed? Do you care what is demonstrated as true? Or are you just going to chase these signs and wonders? And so we have a man here, and it tells us a magician. He, they wouldn't call him that if he wasn't doing some sort of legitimate signs. And that appears that the Lord is allowing this to happen for a time. And he has this man's ear. <clears throat> So he's filling his his ears with false testimony and false signs. And so they're persuading Sergius Paulus away from the Lord here. Even though he he called them, now this man is saying, let's not give them an audience. Let's not listen to them. What they're saying is a lie, maybe. And so Paul, Paul picks up on this. And here it is. Verse 9, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at this man and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, 
Will you not stop making crooked the paths of the Lord? Saul is Paul. Paul, what are you doing? You don't get to go into another culture and tell them that their traditions and their miracle workers and their ways of life are wrong. That's not culturally sensitive. I think we get this detail here because it tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is not just Paul being angry. This is the leading and endorsement of God to speak this harshly to this man. I, w- I want to camp on this, this idea this morning here for a second. Why is the church in America seemingly on the run? That's not saying the church will be defeated because Jesus says the gates of hell, of hell will not prevail against the church. But why is the influence of the church seem to be going down? Why is the darkness seem to be growing? Okay, don't believe me? What month is this that the world acknowledges and is celebrating? Let's celebrate our sexual depravity. Let's do that. That's what's happening today. So what, what's going on? Some churches have closed because of COVID and haven't reopened. Some, m- many, many young, of our young people have walked away choosing a different path. And sometimes the Lord has to remove a lampstand from the church. And I think part of the reason why is because we hear Paul right here and we don't like the way that he talked to an unbeliever. We are fearful because we want a Christianity that jives with culture. One that culture loves and accepts. We want a Christianity that never has to call anyone the son of the devil full of deceit and villainy, enemy of righteousness. We want a Christianity that doesn't mention sexual sins. That's intimate. That's private. That's their business. And it's not just his language, but it starts there. We don't understand that Christianity is a fighting religion. And I don't mean with guns and swords, but I mean it is a fight of ideas and worldviews against the imaginations of men. Let me read later. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Christ and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. See, Paul says... We walk in the flesh, in other words, in the body. He's not talking about sin. But in the body, we do not war in the body. We don't take over the world with guns and knives. We speak the truth of the gospel. What are strongholds? It actually tells us right there. Arguments and every lofty opinion raising against the knowledge of God. I grew up in a church that thought that this meant there was demonic beachheads inside of Christians and you needed exorcisms to get these things out of you. You have a demon of lust. You have a demon of drunkenness. You have a demon of gossip. You have a demon of laziness. And that's what that is. It's lazy thinking. Instead of adopting obedience, agreeing with the, with the Spirit and being sanctified and made a disciple of Christ, we say, well, the devil made me do it. And we don't grow and we don't develop and we don't mature as children of Christ. But Paul is saying we destroy arguments, disagreements that raises themselves up against the knowledge of God. In other words, Christians are supposed to be truth speakers. Truth speakers into a culture that loves lies. A lot of people have a problem with theology because, well, doctrine divides. And I say, good, that's what it's supposed to do. The Word of God says this, but you have said that. You're wrong. The Word of God tells me what's true. The Word of God tells me what the standard is. The Word of God has said this, and that's what I'm going to go with. And certainly, I have had divisions over the Word of God. This is why when I write in my blogs, I put a lot of Scripture in there. Like if, if you want to fight about this, then please look at this Scripture and tell me that it doesn't say what it's saying. 
This is why the church had councils down through time. It wasn't men in, in lofty towers thinking deep thoughts about God. They would have councils in response to false teaching that was rising up in the churches and in the communities. Because truth matters. Theology matters. And what teachers are taking out of the Word of God and presenting to the people desperately matters. Because we've entered a time now in America where we increasingly have more and more people with itching ears. Tell me what I want to hear. Do you know the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And Jesus reiterates this in the New Testament. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now ask yourself, how can we do that if we are putting other ideas of God before the Lord? This is why we must be very careful that our arguments, our ideas, and our teachings are not creating another God. Right? We hear this a lot. My God would never send anyone to hell. My God will welcome everyone in the end. My God wouldn't be so narrow. My God is primarily about love. My God is really actually only the visible, gentle Jesus in the New Testament, not that old curmudgeon God in the Old Testament. Or they will say something like, I could never worship a God who doesn't let simply let people love one another and be who they want to be. You know what the answer to that is, by the way, when someone says, I could never worship a God who? You say, you're right. You don't. If you're worshiping a God at all, you're worshiping a God of the figment of your own imagination. And that's violating the first commandment. You've made another God and you've placed him before the Lord. That's idolatry. Do we see that? <clears throat> Instead, we want to take the idea of God and reinterpret him how it makes, how we like him, how we would want him to be in our culture. And that's why the darkness is growing, because the church is not taking up the witness, is not speaking the truth. No, it is not that. It is this. As Paul said to the Corinthians, your boasting is not good. That's God's message to us during Pride Month. Your boasting is not good, and it will result in judgment. Paul is saying, back to Paul, be ready to have an argument about this. Present the truth. Fight for the truth. Address all those opinions of man. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone thinks they have the best way to handle it. And too often, even in the church, we settle for that. And this is why we need to know what God's Word says. Otherwise, we're just sharing opinions. And we're fighting about opinions online. Remember the little book of Titus we went through a little ways back? Paul says to Titus many times, he tells him he has to correct and he has to rebuke. Titus 1.9, he must, speaking of the leaders, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Later in that book, in, in, in that chapter in verse 13, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Again, in the next chapter, Titus 2.15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. Rebuke them, but God, that's uncomfortable. Can't we just get along? No, and here's why. Look what Paul says to the sorcerer here. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Bad teaching False teaching, false ideas, wrong opinions, bad doctrine, ignoring theology results in crooked paths. It leads sheep astray, maybe even to their doom. And worse, it leaves goats as goats. They don't become sheep. They don't find Christ because they're being lied to and coddled. And so we have to speak the truth. When paths are made crooked, People are led astray, and that's why the church is so weak, because we put up with crooked paths. We, cut, we put up with other ideas of God. Well, maybe God won't actually do what he says in his word. Let's hope that he acts better, in our, in our opinion, better than what he has said. Paul, again, writing in, in this time to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5, he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. 
and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul knows I'm almost out of here. When I'm gone, you're going to have to deal with false teachers and false teaching. Seven, I have fought the good fight. Faith is a fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul knew that it was a fight, and the temptation would always be to not raise a fuss. And this has been the program of the American church. Let's just not raise a fuss. We live in a Christian culture. Let's not raise a fuss. And we have not raised a fuss ourselves into a pagan culture. Confrontation, conflict, that doesn't sound very Christian, but I would encourage you to go read the Gospels again. See how often Jesus was getting into conflict with false religion. It is very Christian to do that. But we need to do it with the right heart. Loving God and wanting to love and save the people that we're speaking to. Because people will raise up their own leaders to tell them what they want to hear. And so we need to be encouraged to find the truth. We need to be encouraged that we have a solid foundation underneath our feet. Man, you, if you guys know the Lord, you are so secure. You are so safe. You are so loved and forgiven. But that foundation needs to be a platform to speak the truth to the world. And we need to use that. So Paul lets this man have it. Son of the devil, enemy of righteousness. I think he's calling him the son of the devil. His name says son of Jesus. Different Jesus, but I think he's kind of having a play on words here. He's calling this man out. And, you guys, and, and understand, this is not to say we are to be fighting all the time. It means we are faithful fighters, but not eager fighters. We don't go out looking for fights, enjoying the fight. We should be fighting with sadness in our hearts that we are to this play, point. But when the gospel is undermined and paths are made crooked, then the man of God must respond. And this is for all of us, not just the man up front. All Christians need to be willing to speak the truth. We are faithful soldiers. We're not warmongers. In other words, we must know what the goal is. And if you're going to fight to what end, and Paul has told us when paths are made crooked, if the teachings and arguments and ideas are leading people astray, when it's resulting in disobedience to Christ. See, if people are being taught disobedience to Christ, to the Word of God, we must speak up. And I pray that we, many of us would. Because if not, there are eternal consequences. For example, the Word tells us, thou shalt not steal, and culture says, well, in this case, they have been oppressed. It's okay to rob and burn down that street, as we've seen in the last couple of years, haven't we? They've had it wrong, so let's go ahead and allow them to steal and rob and loot. No. There's a standard, and we all need to be called to it. And I hope that more pastors would speak up and say that. In our culture t today, the month of June is to celebrate our sexual sins. The church must respond, No. That lifestyle will lead you to not inherit the kingdom of God. You must repent and, and turn. And I'm telling you this because I love you. I don't want you to go that way. We just need to understand, guys, that the gospel speaks into culture. It's supposed to speak into our world. And there's a reason that America is growing darker. Let's remember of our call to speak. But Gabe, this clouds the issue, and it makes life, makes us not welcome in the culture. Yeah, it does. It makes life difficult. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 2, 6. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to who? False prophets. Those who said, yeah, we don't, let's not talk about that. Let's not worry about that. That's not true. There's no judgment. Let's just be happy and comforted. Galatians 1.10, Paul writing, for Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. To be a follower of Christ is not to be a man pleaser. And if we're not willing to do that, then we have misunderstood the faith. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. And God teaches us to look past the fear of man to the approval of God. And so sometimes we have to say hard things because the Lord has hard things in store for people who don't respond. And we do say this because we care and we desire people to find life with God, actual life in the Lord, right? Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace with the world, but a sword. He came to bring peace with God, absolutely, but not peace amongst us, one another. The peace God brings is a personal relationship with Him. It's not about ease in life. And here's, here's my next point. Christians must speak uncomfortable truth. That's part of our job description. That's part of our identity. That's part of us knowing that we are in this world now, but we know who the Father is. We know what's coming. And we don't want that to befall our loved ones. Those that we care about, we have to speak truth. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. I feel that a little bit this morning, and I'm speaking to believers. I pray that you all know the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Here's more words of Jesus in Matthew 10. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have came to the earth to bring peace I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a son's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, what's the temptation? But Lord, I want peace in my family. I want peace with my friends and my coworkers. I just want things easy and calm. Notice he said, peace on earth. He does desire peace with us, with, between man and God. But peace amongst those on the earth will be challenging because a lot of people will hate this message. Many of us, this message will result with a sword even amongst those closest to us. And for many of us, we hate that and we're unwilling to pay that price. Let me just say, church, Christians, that's something we need to repent of. Desiring a certain kind of peace and comfort and tranquility here on the world, or even within our own families, to the ignoring of God, that's something we need to repent of if we're doing that. Plead with your family and your loved ones Come to know Christ. Be reconciled to Jesus. Time is running out. We don't know when the end is going to come. Plead with your brothers and sisters. Don't fall into a lull. Oh, well, they don't like it when I say that. They need to hear it again. They need to hear it again. It's only when we do that that we become useful in the hands of the Master. And this is why the Apostle Paul can speak so boldly, ignoring customs of proper speak to dignitaries in a foreign in a city. He doesn't only speak, but he declares a judgment upon this man. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and will, you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So Paul doesn't only lay the hammer of rebuke, there's an accompanying immediate judgment. Blindness. This made me think of the two towers. Are any of you guys uh, Lord of the Rings fans here? With the freeing of King Theoden from King of Rohan, under the control of his chief advisor, Grima Wormtongue. Any Lord of the Rings fans out there? Gandalf says, be silent and keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. And he calls this man, listen, he says, crooked words of a witless worm. Crooked words of that had kept the king in bondage. And in the movie, he removes the curse from the king, he removes Grima from his presence, and frees him to rule his kingdom with a clear and sound mind. And the question for us this morning is, who is speaking to clear up the clouded mind of our loved ones? 
Who is speaking to clear up the deception and lies of our culture? Is it you? Is it me? That's what we're called to do. Be light. First point in this two-part point here is God must liberate those locked in darkness. And this is why we need to understand this so desperately. If God is the one who must liberate, then I have to use his means, which is the gospel. I don't get to try to come up with easier methods. I think they'll like it better if I do this. I think it like it, they'll like it better if I leave this out. I think it, they'll like it better if I just talk about maybe this one attribute of God over here. No, God has to deliver people from darkness, and so we have to speak the direct truth. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to yell. We don't have to call names. We speak it with a broken heart in love, but we have to speak directly. We have to speak the truth. God liberates those locked in darkness. I think J.R.R. Tolkien was a fan of the Bible. So the man standing against them had all this power, and then the Lord drains it in the presence of this leader of the city. This man had been demonstrating power, and so then God now uses his influence. Now your guy's blind. If he really had the power of God, God would not allow him to be taken out and a different message propped up in its place as if it was God doing this. And so there's a demonstration of power to unseat the false prophet, the magician, from poisoning the mind of the, of the man of influence. And Paul knew what it was to be in darkness, didn't he? On the road to Damascus, and he has this amazing transformation. God darkens his mind. The scales are put in his mind, on his eyes, and for three days he neither eats or speaks. In the darkness, the weight of the darkness that he is walking in, God allows him to feel it. And then God says, I will lift your darkness. And it sounds like this is just temporary, but God has allowed this man now to see the darkness that he is spreading. And we have to recognize this. We need the power of the Lord to come out of our darkness. We need the mercy of God to raise us up from the dead, to steal us away from false allegiances to our preoccupations, for our ideas of local peace, the pictures of the way that ought to be, our pleasures, our comforts, our temptations our sins. We need someone to come along and say, look at your blind guides. They're leading you astray. Because you want a guide who can see, right? You want a gospel that is real. You want a God who can actually save. You want the light, not the darkness. Let me read a little bit about this. Revelation three seventeen. This is Jesus. Remember, this is Jesus speaking to a church here. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. He's not saying that to unbelievers. He's speaking that to a church in Revelation. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're blinded. So where's the light? Who's coming along and extinguishing the darkness? God uses His gospel message as the light that opens men's eyes. Later in the book, there's this part of the speech, Acts 16, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me the Lord speaking. And so my next point is God uses the gospel as this light. We are the light bearers, but the light is the gospel. The light is his truth. The light is the message of Jesus Christ. We are the light bearers. Are we speaking into the world? Surely you guys recognize the writing on the wall. We are in judgment in our, com- in our country. If you don't believe me, go read the first few chapters of Romans. We very much appear to be a country that has been given over to their sin. Which means there need to be light bearers. There needs to be torch bearers. There needs to be people speaking the truth. I pray that God grants us repentance. And that we're not another Rome who falls in their own sin. This is a pattern in world history. 
countries acknowledge the Lord, get big, too big for their britches, they forget the Lord, and the Lord destroys them, has a changing of the guard. And I would say that would be a huge tragedy to happen in America because there are so many believers here. But we've been putting our head underneath our pillows. So let's look at the result here. Paul speaks clearly, directly, maybe even harshly. Extinguishes the darkness. Verse 12, Then the proconsul believed, and he saw what had occurred, and he was astonished, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So they got rid of the liar. They got rid of the guy who was clouding his mind, the poison, and then he was able to hear the truth, and he believed. Paul and Barnabas preach the gospel, and as he believes, and now what kind of a door is there open for those under this man's influence? The magic is gone, the ruler believes, meaning there will most likely be freedom for the message to spread. See, when the rulers are godly, what will the land look like? And when the rulers are ungodly, what does the land look like? Well, look around. We have our answer. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders that they would have men and women of light speaking into their ears. Pray for those in position of authority that those that are in darkness that are whispering into their ears, or if it's them themselves, that God would remove them. Pray that God would deliver us from evil. Pray that God would deliver us from evil laws. Pray that God would deliver us from evil lawmakers. Pray that God would set up a standard. Pray that he would grant us repentance. And pray that we would be bold to be light bearers in our country. That's what we need, church. If the darkness concerns you, be a light. That's our job. My conclusion is simply be a light bearer. Be a light bearer. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a missionary, but you do got to bear the light that God has given you in your area, in your oikos, in your influence, in your family, in your loved ones, in your business. Shine. Shine. And pray that the Lord would grant us repentance. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us the mechanism to speak the truth, Lord. God, I pray that you would give us the adjoining boldness. God, I pray that you would empower us to do the work of ministry. It's shining in the areas that you've called us to shine at, Lord, speaking where we need to speak. God, I pray that we would have enough love in our hearts and mercy for our families to say something uncomfortable once more. God, because we know how this ends. God, help us to carry that burden, the burden of being a follower of Christ, a burden of being a torchbearer. Help us to speak, but give us the graciousness to do it well. And let us always do all of these things for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Have an amazing week. And uh, if you don't have any plans, please join us for sports camp this week. Take care, everyone. Have an awesome week. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to this message from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. Feel free to make copies of this message to give away to others, but please don't alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit our website at www.gracepointtucson.org.